Okay, the uh, game we're going to be looking at today is Pericles, designed by Mark Herman, published by GMT, and it came out in 2017. Now this video will be a little bit different than some of the other ones I've done before. I'm trying something kind of new. I may have to do this video in two parts. So what you're going to see before you as I speak is the uh, beautiful components of the game. So it's in the nature of a slide show, really, for part one. I have nothing negative to say about the game. The game is a masterpiece in every sense of the word. It's a beautiful game and a great simulation. It's really Mark Herman's magnum opus to the Peloponnesian War. So... All I want to say about the game are positive things. So what I'm going to say now has nothing to do with the game. I want to get out in the open uh, my prejudice, which is a highlight of the game, and it's not a negative of the game itself, and that's the use of bots or solitaire play. Now, I, might, I know Mark is very... Um, up on doing bots. He's done them for other games. I think he has one for Empire of the Sun and others, but uh, I'm not into bots. I play war games to play uh, human beings. So when I want to get um, across at the beginning is that that's a personal prejudice of mine. So if you don't mind playing with bots or solitaire, that, that's fine but I usually like to play human beings. And uh, Pericles is designed for four players. The only down comment I have will be in probably part two at the very end of the video. So if you don't want to hear me expound why I'm not into bots, you don't even need to see part one. Because part one, as I speak, is just going to be um, slides showing you the, uh, the beautiful components. So what it is, what is it about bots that I don't like in this game? Well, uh, Mark, in his uh, playbook, in the comprehensive example of play, which is quite good, lasts for several pages. The trouble is, um, his example of play, which I find is one of the most important things to do in a playbook, concerns having one human player and three bots. I would have far preferred a detailed example of play with four human players. Now that's just, again, my personal um, pet peeve about bots, and it is not a knock against the game. So whatever I have to say about the game now is going to be positive, and I have one regret, which will be in probably part two of the video. Okay. What's good about this game? Well, just about everything. It's, I think, one of the best game simulations on the Peloponnesian War, bar none. I think it's even better than Mark Herman's earlier game, Peloponnesian War. This is a study in that war. It's beautifully designed, cleverly designed. There's a lot of moving parts to it, and the learning curve to learn it is not easy, which is why I really didn't like the bot example of play. I want to learn this game. I want to know this game, but it's going to take time to learn it. And even after you've read the rules, forward, backwards, everywhere, and I've read them twice now, um, you're still not really going to know how to play this game. You certainly won't know the optimum strategies. This is a game that has to be played to be understood. It's that complicated. <laughs> On the other hand, it's not that complicated, but there's a lot of moving parts. It's going to take you a while to learn this game. It's certainly taking me a while to play it, to learn it. And I haven't even played it with, human com uh, with humans yet. I've just played against the bots, learning the systems, and... Um, the learning curve is going to be 
quite daunting on this. So what's good about the game? Well, the cards. The cards are great. As I'm going to explain in the video portion, I'll show those how they work and tell you a, a, a general overview of the game. I will not attempt to teach you the game in a video. That's, that's almost impossible. Although I have seen several videos out there. There's one fellow out there, he's from Scotland, and he's got a great uh, teaching video. Mark Herman also has his own teaching video, but personally I find them very long, and Mark tends to get off on tangents and gets away from the goal of making it a teaching video. So I, I don't find it's the best teaching tool. I think other people have done better jobs on it. Two of the video reviewers, Marco Arnardo and Callendale, did extensive reviews of them, and I suggest you watch them. In part two of my video, I found that I reached the same conclusions that Marco reached and Callendale reached in their videos. But I won't get to that until I do part two of the video. So I'll end this part one, which is really just an overview of the components. As you can see, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, I'll um, adjust the time of the uh, video. You might need more time to see the components, I don't know. I'm working it at about 15 seconds per slide right now, but they may have to change. So that's it for um, part one of this brief look at Pericles, the Peloponnesian War. Thank you for watching. Okay, in part one of the video, all I really showed was the lovely components of the game, which are of very high quality, and I explained why I didn't like the comprehensive example of play, since it really was showing one human player and three bots, and I explained how I'm not really interested in playing against bots. Now, lest people be aghast, I do not damage the original booklets. I always work from copies. So this way I can highlight and emphasize things that I have trouble with or want to find quicker than the index can show. So what you're seeing uh, are copies of the rules, not the original rules. Now in this video, I'm not gonna possibly try to explain to you how the game plays. That would need a much longer video. Actually, it would need several videos. I think the best way to learn the game via videos is to uh, do several uh, videos. Perhaps one just on the political phase alone, perhaps another one on the theater phase, and uh, maybe on the military. So this is just going to be a very general overview of the game. Now there's one little snag in the uh, setting up the game which People may have missed, I don't know, I certainly missed it, and it is missing in the setup. In the setup, I expect to do everything to set up the game and be done with it. But we've got this, there's something missing. It says here we shuffle the three decks, the Aristophanes, the Athens, political and Spartan. We've done all that. We've shuffled the Athens deck, and we shuffle the Spartan deck, and we shuffle the Aristophanes deck just like the instructions state. And then it more or less says you go to the abbreviated sequence of play, which begins with the Aristophanes phase. But already we have a problem because something's missing in the setup. And it's actually in the playbook. And I'll show you what I mean. Now the remedy is here. Like I said, it's in the playbook. Where it says the special scenario rules indicate at each Spartan faction begins the scenario with their faction leader, as always, plus a specified card, da da da. So before you shuffle the deck, you're gonna to have to take out the faction leader cards. There's uh, four of them, two Spartan and uh, two Athenian. So those have gotta be separated first and that's missing in the setup. I certainly missed it and uh, why it's in the comprehensive example of play and not in the rules, I don't know why. An omission, I guess. 
but it's a critical one, and you need to know that. But even that's rather incomplete, because he does say here, each Spartan faction, he doesn't even talk about the Athenian. That's because the Athenian uh, faction in this example of play will be run by the bots. But they still have to have those cards separated, I would think. I don't know. But I'm going to leave the bot structure because, like I said, I'm not into bots. I don't care about bots. So uh, watch out for that when you're first learning the game. You'll have to set aside the uh, faction leader cards, of which there are four. Now for optimum play, the game should be played by four human players. It was designed that way. But Mark has made the, uh, the bot system so that you can play one player, two players, three or four. So if you're playing, I'll assume, four human players. One player will take the Europonded party, another will take the Agiad party, and they're all, all part of the Spartan um, Peloponnesian League. Now it'll be upside down, but I'll move the camera. Two other players would take the aristocrats on the left, and the other party would be the demagogues. So it's four individuals trying to win the game. Of course, you're trying to get your side to win the war, Sparta versus Athens, Peloponnesian League against the Delian League. But personal victory is done by acquiring the most honor. And that's done by getting your individual honor chit for your party up that track. Most scenarios, the honor begins at 10, and you try to get your honor going up that track. And it's quite a long track. This track goes up to 99. Now, I haven't played it long enough to know how far you generally get up there. So this is like a little racehorse track. Immediately you know who's kind of winning individually by watching these markers move on the track. Or down, by the way. So honor for the individual player is the most important thing for winning the game. So it's quite possible, therefore, to have you win the game individually. Let's say I'm playing the Euro Ponted player and I get the highest honor. I personally have won the, the game and yet I could be on the losing side. Athens could defeat Sparta. So that's dual victory conditions and I think they're kind of clever. Uh, that's why I, I, it must be a lot of fun to play this in a four-player game. Now let's take a look at the political side of the game. Now this is not going to be a detailed examination of how to play the game. I'm just going to highlight certain things you're going to be doing. I just want to explain overall what you're trying to achieve. Well, in the political part of the game, your party is trying to win more issues against the enemy party. And you alternate back and forth between the Europonted and the Agiad party by placing issues on your track or in the middle. For example, let's say the Europonted player wanted to debate a military issue. And there's various rules whether they go on the one or two track. I'm giving you a very simplified um, illustration of what goes on. And let's say the Agiad player also chose a military. That's an issue that would be debated. Then we go back to the Europonted, and he might pick um, a league issue, which you might put on the one space. There's also instances where you put three issues in the middle on the zero space, and the Agiad player does the same. He might want to debate another military issue, maybe consult the oracles, or a war and peace issue. Now that's a simplified version of how the debating starts in the game. You may have noticed these little remarkers here, and the Europonded player has this little marker on his side, while the Agad player does not. This means that he's the dominant party, and we mark it also here to show he's dominating the assembly. Therefore, he would go first. Again, I'm simplifying things down, but in this case, I've got nine cards here and nine cards for the other party. Yes, I didn't explain about the brain trust where you can set aside three cards 
there's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts even to this. But for the purposes of the video and simplification, let's say the uh, your pondered player wanted to debate a league issue. So what he would do is he'd look at look at his cards. It isn't drawn randomly. He'd look at a card at his cards, and since it's a league issue, he would want to pick a card. Where yeah, there's a good card, and he doesn't show it to the other player yet. And the other guy knows that he's debating a league issue. He would look at his cards, and he might want to win that. So he looks for a league issue, and he has one too. All right. So he would play this. And both cards would be shown. And you would take the two on this card, add it to three, five, and three plus one, four. So this side, your opponent, has won the issue. And then when that is the case, the issue that he was debating on goes up one notch. So that's generally how you uh, do the debating. Yes, there's strategos that are also taken from the pile here, but I won't get into that. Again, that's generally how the debates work. Meanwhile, on the other side of the board, the Athenian two players are doing the same thing. This can be done simultaneously or alternate. It doesn't really matter. But once the debating is finished, then you're going to take those issues, all the ones you've won, and convert them to these little markers here which is the same thing, rumor, league, diplomatic, except you see they're a different color and they also are specific to your side. The EK counters are the Europonted, the AK counters are the Agiad. All right, for the sake of argument, let's say that the Europonted player won three issues and the Agiad player won two issues. Yes, this is simplified, it's more complicated than that, but generally, that's what you do. Then in the theater phase, the your pointed player, the Agiad player. Meanwhile, you've got two guys over there too, the aristocrats and the demagogues would take their issues, converted to these bluish markers, and one by one, they would be placed on various theaters on the board. Now this is not a setup, I've just randomly put uh, units down there. So let's say the Europonded player is going first, and he would place one issue face down on the theater of the war that he wants to influence, face down. So this player and those players don't know what that issue is. You know? And then the second player, whoever that person will be, and that will change, he would put a marker down, put his issue. He might put it in the same theater, he might put it in a different theater. We'll say he puts one there. Then the third player would put an issue down. He could put it on the same theater or a different theater. Let's say in this case he puts it on top. Then back to the Athenian player, he puts another issue. Let's say he challenges this and puts it on top. And Mark has a rule, and it makes sense. The first chit in is the last chit that goes out. Because when you go to resolve these issues, you always have to resolve the top issue first. So there's a very little sub-game right in here about who goes first and how these issues affect the game. So all the debating over here on the left certainly is going to affect what goes on in the theater. Now, once you get to the theater phase, all kinds of stuff can happen. For example, let's say you won the league issue. There's four options there. So... One of the options is construct a base. Another option is convert a base. Another option is build military units. Or option four, remove any treachery markers, which I didn't really explain. But that's how you create military forces on the board with the various issues that you've won. And that's just a league issue. Um, Oracle issue. What if you won that? You gain three honor. Well, that's kind of nice. Remember those markers I told you about over on the side, the honor markers? Well, if you played that, your honor marker is here, up she'd go three. So some of them issues 
just give direct results on the honor table. The military issue, of course, is much more complex. It's so complex, it has its own little section after, because so many different things can happen in the military issue, depending on whether the area is friendly, uh, enemy, neutral, empty, and then that's going to take a couple of pages to explain. But overall, if enemy forces are in the area, and you can move forces in, that's the beauty of the game too, you can have um, combat. Now I guess I should explain about the colors of the units. Red units are Spartan. Yellow units are Spartan allies, all part of the Peloponnesian League. Blue are Athens, and white are part of the Delian League. So, again, Athens against Sparta, but with their allies, the Delian League, the white counters, and yellow for the Spartan. Now, it's, it's the interaction of all these rules, the politics, the military, that make this such a delightful game and a good simulation of a war. Now, I haven't even got into the Strategos, which you're going to want to acquire to help you in combat, create bases. There's a mine of information in this game. As you saw in part one of the video, the player aids for the game are absolutely superb. You've got individual charts for what happens, land theater, what the values are, naval theater, what they are, the combat losses for the loser, for the winner, naval combat losses for the loser and winner. The playing aids are just superb. And uh, You've got more aids here too. League issues, military issues, the oracle, ostracism. I haven't got into that. I couldn't possibly get into all the sub-menus of the game. It, it's just a dynamite game. You've got this terrific setup chart for playing any scenarios. I might point out that there are a lot of scenarios in the game. Let me count them. Yeah, I count uh, 23 scenarios in this game. So there's no way that this game is going to get stale, that's for sure. And uh, that's not even counting the solitaire scenarios. Again, those are mainly against the bots. I should point out that a lot of the activities you're going to do have to be hidden from your uh, opposing faction. And you get these uh, cute little uh, screens. There are four of them in the game. And in it... They show an abbreviated sequence of play and what each of the issues are. And the other side is just generic. That's all the enemy sees. And uh, again, the Athenians get their sequence of play. So GMT has done very well with this edition of the game. I have to mention the map because it was done by Newt Grunitz. Uh, who does beautiful jobs on maps. He's done uh, uh, the map from War for America, and he's got a lot of credits, and I love the way he does his maps. I love this period map kind of in the background, and the theaters are very well delineated. By the way, the blue boxes for the theaters indicate primarily a naval theater, and the brown boxes primarily is a... Um, land theater. Um, movement factors are all explained here, how you move the men. The granaries are important but with these granary symbols. Uh, I just touched the surface of this game. It really deserves uh, multi-videos. That's what I uh, think someone should do. Is do a, I'm not the person to do it because I, I don't know the game uh, that well. I have yet to play it with uh, human players. I'm just still studying it with the bots, playing solitaire, learning the charts, and there's a lot here. It's uh, the learning curve on this one is um, quite daunting. I mentioned in the first video that uh, I would mention the only regret I have about purchasing the game, and it's not really a negative. In fact, it's rather a positive. The 
only regret that I have with this game is that I probably won't get to play it very much. And, and Rico and uh, Callendale said as much in their videos. Because the game is so in-depth, the learning curve is quite steep, you're going to need at least one player that knows this game very well to teach it to three other players. And I have a hard time getting four people together to play such a complex game. And, um, you know, you're going to dedicate a lot of time to it. And as Mark himself has said, you're not going to unlock the treasures of this game by playing it once. You're going to have to play it several times, dedicate a lot of time to it to really appreciate how great this game is. And it is a great game. I'm inclined to put it in the masterpiece uh, category. I uh, categorize very few games as masterpieces. One of them is Republic of Rome by Avalon Hill. I think it's a masterpiece. Uh, the second one is Empire of the Sun, done by Mark Herman himself. I think it's a masterpiece of the Pacific War. And the third one is the U.S. Civil War by Mark McLaughlin. I think it's a masterpiece. And I would like to give this game masterpiece status also, but I'm loath to do so without having played it with four players. I don't know how the experience will be with four players. I suspect it's going to be a lot of fun. I don't know. Some of the cursory reviews I've seen say that they like the game, there's a lot to it, they're glad they purchased it, but some of them hint that they didn't find it that much fun to play. I wouldn't know, I just haven't played it. I have no regrets about purchasing this game. And uh, here it is, what, years after it first came out. So I did not buy it in 2017. I've only owned the game now, what, two weeks or so. I've been studying it just about every day, moving the counters around, and uh, I've got a vested interest in learning this game. I'm very interested in the Peloponnesian War. And so far, um, it does not conflict with anything I've read. Um, for those of you who haven't read anything about it, you can't go wrong by reading... Uh, Thucydides, History of the Peloponnesian War. It's still a terrific account. It certainly is interesting to read the mindset of a man who lived over 2,000 years ago. This is a fine classic, and uh, you might enjoy reading it. But the game reinforces everything I've read in Thucydides, and that's a good thing. So in closing, I'd like to say one last thing about the game. And... For those of you who are having trouble learning it or are kind of turned off about how complicated it is or don't think you can handle it, um, I'm reminded of a famous quote by Arthur C. Clarke, and I'll quote it in a second. Um, when Arthur C. Clarke's book came out, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Stanley Kubrick's movie, uh, a lot of people were um, couldn't figure out the ending. And uh, the movie was criticized for that. And Clark got all kinds of um, letters and comments asking, uh, you know, hey, explain the ending. And Clark was, you know, trying to sell the book at that time. And Arthur C. Clark's quote, I find, is applicable to learning Pericles. Clark's quote was, read the book, see the film, and repeat the dose as often as necessary, unquote. And that's really true for Pericles. It's daunting to learn. Um, rules of play are, are pretty good. I said, watch out for that snag about the setup and stuff. The playbook is fine, except for my old pet peeve about bots. I wish Mark had designed it with uh, four players uh, in the illustrations. That's, I have nothing negative to say about the game itself. It's uh, a beautifully produced game. So that's it for Pericles. Maybe I'll get a chance to play this someday at a convention. I know a bunch of us are meeting next week or so to try Republic of Rome. Maybe I can uh, get some of the guys to try Pericles. Anyway, um, that's it for part two of Pericles, and uh, thank you for watching.